Well, terrific. Here we are again, three good friends. You know who I'm talking about. Over here on my left is our good friend Mel from Ireland. And, and down below, uh, there is Murad back again, handsome as ever. And uh, this is going to be an interesting topic. This is a topic that I'm not that familiar with. But most of you who have probably been watching the news and have been watching what's been happening in the last, well, since 2014 especially, all these young wolves who have been blowing themselves up and killing themselves and uh, trying to get to paradise and killing as many people as possible in order to get there. You hear this referring uh, reference to these virgins, these hoodies uh, in the Quran in chapter 55 and in chapter 56 and in chapter 76. You have reference to these hoodies, these perpetual virgins, these women who are in heaven who are waiting for them. And this is the reward they're coming to when they get to heaven. And uh, it's, it's always bemused us, it's bemused me, and uh, Murad and Mel have been looking into this, and Mel has come up with a theory, and uh, we brought Murad on board because he's going to check, make sure that we get the Arabic correct. Uh, Murad has also just put up a video three weeks ago. Go check his site, St. Murad. If you look right down here at the bottom, I'm going to put the, or going to put the uh, URL. Go up and look at his video. It's, it's just a few minutes long, and see what his conclusion is on these hoodies. Uh, these 72 hoodies. What we're going to do today is bring up another category or another criteria or even another possibility. Uh, and this is one that Mel has come up with, and it has an awful lot to do with St. Ephraim. Now, who, who is St. Ephraim? For many of you, you probably don't know who he is. He died in 373 in the 4th century, uh, lived in and, and was from Edessa. Uh, he was a Christian and as one of the most prolific writers and what uh, we're finding an awful lot of the Quran is from his material the, uh, from the fourth century and that that's why um, today we're looking at Saint Ephraim bringing him in uh, because of what the impact he has had on the Quran we've said this many times that much of the Quran many of the stories much, much of the poetry much of the beautiful parts of the Quran are from other sources Saint Ephraim is one of the most prolific uh, today, uh, where he lived, it would be called Saniurfa. It's in Turkey, so it's much further north, and it's much earlier, 4th century. We're talking about 300 years earlier. Okay, Mel, good to have you on board. Murad, all the way from the Middle East. Thanks for staying up. I know I'm I'm here in Denver, Colorado, of all places, and uh, I'm at a big conference, and so we can do this anywhere. That's one of the beauties of technology. But over to you, Mel. What is it, and who are these 72 virgins? And really, what is St. Ephraim talking about? Yeah, well, it's uh, great to be back. Um, I think you did a great introduction. Um, St. Ephraim was uh, like a superstar in the 4th century. He, he wrote... 400 hymns or more, possibly more, um, and they are all really deep, full of symbolism. And I think the key thing about St. Ephraim, the, the clue to understanding him, is all of his hymns were about one person, about Christ. It was all focused on, on Christ. So even though he might be talking about fruit, he might be talking about trees, he might be talking about flowers, whatever it might be, he's always thinking of Christ. He's always bringing it back to Christ. So don't be surprised if... When you're looking at one of his hymns that actually that's what he's really talking about the danger of course with symbolism is someone might come along read it literally and go away with the wrong end of the stick and i think this is what's happened with many of the passages in the quran they've taken his text not properly understood what it refers to and deduced something else and this is a fatal mistake um, and it's kind of embarrassing now as as we'll see so murad good to have you on board as well Thank you very much. It's always a pleasure to join you, Dr. Smith and Mel from uh, Islamic Origins, of course. Murad, we've been going, we've been doing this for quite a few years now, haven't we? And it's ter it's terrific to to get your take on it because not only you are you a native Arab speaker, you're doing an entire new work. And just uh, just real quickly, the work you're doing on the Quran. Can you just help us real quickly? I like people to know what you're doing with the Quran. Yes, I'm currently translating the Quran, and I know that people listening will say, well, we don't need another translation. I, I, I reply, this is a, a very big mistake because what you have is not a translation. It's just like a, a phantom. So what I'm doing is actually I have built a dictionary from scratch, or you could call it a concordance, 
bringing every single word in the Quran with all its variations and bringing the, the synonyms closer together and trying to see exactly the subtle differences between every word. And this gets uh, much different results than what we are actually used to. So my translation will be uh, very different and very unique because this is work that has not been done before in this fashion. And actually, everyone who translates the Quran is obsessed with the Bible. They just say the words that is written in the King James Bible because this is what's closer to their mind and what's closer to their ear. This is wrong. You have to work it from scratch, and this is what I'm doing with the Quran translation right now. Brilliant. Murad, so good to have you on board, and you're going to be the one who is going to, that Mel is going to go to, to make sure we have the uh, the words correct, make sure we have the translations correct. When you finish your dictionary, we're going to make sure, uh, I'm sorry, your translation of the Quran, we're going to get you up on board and we're going to push it out so everybody can buy it and use it and then have it available in their own in their own studies. Okay, Mel, back to you. Okay, so cracking St. Ephraim's code, um, I found this quote from him uh, in his hymns on virginity. Wherever you look, God's symbol is there. Wherever you read, you will find his types. For him, all creatures were created and he stamped all his possessions with his symbols when he created the world. So St. Ephraim is all about metaphor. He's all about symbol. And he pumps all of his hymns full of symbols, but they are all symbols to do with God and Christ in particular. And I think that's the clue to unravel the meaning behind his hymns. And of course, if the Quranic text is borrowing from his hymns, whether they realize it or not, they're borrowing the symbolism that he used originally. Uh, I, I like this quote from a movie, one of my favorite movies, actually, the movie called The Way. Um, it says, the idea of a pilgrim's journey on this road is a metaphor bonanza. Well, I'm going to suggest that for St. Ephraim, the vineyard is a metaphor bonanza, and he just loves the this metaphor. And there's a good reason for it, because his own name means doubly fruitful. Um, this symbolic meaning of his name related to fruit um, became a central motif of his hymns, known as madrashes, or teaching hymns. Um, Murad, um, the word madrashe, that's obviously a Syriac word, but is there anything equivalent to that in Arabic? The closest would be madrasa, and darasa means study. So madrasa would not be a school. It would be exactly a studying place, a place for study. Yeah. So back in the fourth century, um, churches would have used these hymns as a way of teaching the congregation all about the, the gospel message. They were very useful, so they could fit a lot of the gospel message in the hymns. And I think even today that would be part of the function of hymns, but it was even more so back then. So that's Madrashi. Um, I found this online, uh, uh, this guy, uh, V. Edward G. Matthews, summarizes St. Ephraim's Christology as, uh, Christ is the center and focus of everything and he cannot help but see Christ in all things. And this turns out to be very useful in terms of decoding his hymns. Now, there's two key passages that we all talk about uh, and try to decipher the meaning of them. Uh, one of them is Surah 37, 48 to 49. Bell gives the translation of this as, with them are damsels rest restrained in glance, wide-eyed, as they were eggs, well-guarded. Um, Murad, could you give us the Arabic? It's there. Yeah, as I said, this is highly problematic. Let's look at it word by word. وَعِنْدَهُمْ means and with them. Or كِسَارَاتُ tarf. This is, um, this guy here says restrained in glance. And this is the, uh, the current understanding. But this is really a Sunni understanding. The word itself could mean those having short extremities or having a short branch, something like this. So it's easier to think of it as uh, a tree having a branch that's short, meaning that you can reach it. You can you can reach the fruit with your hand. Wow. And here it says, Ain كَأَنَّهُمْ بَيْضٌ مَكْنُونَ The word bayd here, which is translated as eggs, uh, I want you to remember also that this is the same word for white, bayd, abiyad, 
is the same word for white. And Maknoon, it doesn't mean well guarded, it means something like hidden. You see, so this is the, the current Arabic no Syriac influence in, in what I'm telling you right now. So that's interesting. Just, just real quickly, could you then now retranslate it using the, the your translation? How would you then translate this this verse 47? It will be something like, uh, and with them are uh, short extremities um, as a source, as if it's uh, hidden white, something like this. Okay. okay. And in your context, this would be a branch. Yeah, yeah. A tarf is uh, it's an extremity, but not only for a human being, an extremity for a tree also, like okay. a branch. And the white would, would refer to what? It, no, here it could mean eggs, because uh, by it on its own, it would be eggs. I'm just saying that it's also possible to mean uh, whiteness, uh, because here, by it on its own, it's a noun. So you will have to say eggs. But this is, I'm speaking Arabic. Of course, I will hear Melna what he says in Syriac. Yeah, so Luxembourg gives a meaning very similar to what you're saying. We'll, we'll come to that shortly. We're going to have a look at one other key uh, ayah that actually has generated a lot of discussion, which is Surah 7619. So Bell's translation is around... So I'll say that again. So Bell's translation is round amongst them go boys of perpetual youth, whom when one sees, he thinks them pearls unstrung. How would you um, state that in Arabic and what meaning would you give to it? Uh, Yatuf comes from Tawaf. It means circumambulate. So circumambulate upon them or will then and will then comes from walad. Walad and yalid means give birth. So al walid is one who gives birth. Walad is the one who is birthed. So this doesn't give you a gender. So it's Wildan Mukhalladun would be immortal children, not necessarily boys, because a boy is a sabi. It's the same word uh, given for Jesus in the Quran where it says he have spoken as a sabi. That does this doesn't mean as an infant, it means as a boy, a young boy. so Wayatufaihim Wildan Mukhalladun means and circumambulating <coughs> upon them are immortal children is the right time if uh, when you see them you would reckon them to be um, pearls that are dispersed okay so that that's that's a, a very interesting take on it and it's interesting that Bell goes for boys rather than children. Um, and is would you think that is because of he's been influenced by the, the Sunni narrative on that? No, let me tell you that within this, the Quran translation, I am sure if you go to this guy, I have not read this translation, you will find that the word wilad or wildan is translated as children in other places. So yeah. they are just, it's like, they know by heart that here it means boys, but here it means children. All over the Quran you have amwalukum uh, awladukum fitna, like your the money and the children are a uh, fitna. It's translated this way all over the English Qurans, and here they never say the boys. <laughs> they only say it here. So you're, they're not well, consistent. Is what you're saying. And they are not consistent at all. And this is a huge problem in every single Quran translation I have looked at. That's amazing. Yeah. Okay. So St. Ephraim uses pearls as a symbol for Christ. Surah 76, 19 and 52, 54 both compare these boys, which obviously is potentially a wrong translation, to pearls. Luxembourg notes that elsewhere, white grapes are also referred to as pearls. And I found this passage from St. Ephraim, he, where he compares Christ to a pearl. He says, one day, my brothers, I picked up a pearl. I saw within it mysteries, O sons of the kingdom, images and types of that majesty. It became a fountain, and from it I drank of the mysteries of the sun. So you can see here he's identifying Jesus, who's the king, who's the son, as the pearl. 
this might be a clue to the real meaning of the Quranic passage. So why does the Quran refer to both white grapes and boys as pearls? So what is the common factor here? Um, Luxembourg asks, how can one linguistically make boys into grapes? Now, he suggests Wilden is boy in Arabic, but you would say what, um, uh, Murad, you, you, just to reiterate. I would say child, not necessarily a boy. But remember, today in Arabic, when we say walad, we mean boy. So maybe Christoph Luxembourg is influenced by how we speak today. But when you go to the root, the word walad means a child, not necessarily a boy. Yeah. So Luxembourg, even though he's got the wrong end of the stick here, he still, he still thinks there is a, a different meaning in the Syriac, but actually lines up with what you've just said. He says, however, in Syriac, Yalda means both child and fruit, such as fruit of the vine in Syriac is Yalda da Jepeta. And if you open up a Peshitta, which is the Syriac version of the Gospels, you can actually find Yalda used in this context. So this is a very familiar uh, quote from Matthew's Gospel. I will not drink henceforth from this child of the vine, since I will drink it new with you in my father's kingdom. Now, we often hear this in English as fruit of the vine, but it might surprise many of our viewers to find that in Syriac it can mean both child of the vine and fruit of the vine, which is a nice pun there. And this yeah, fits but, in uh, with... If, yeah. if, if you look at it and say, I will not drink henceforth from that which is born of the vine, then maybe this would be the exact word. It's birth. Uh, well, it means birth. Yeah. Um, would uh, would a fair parallel to birth be the produce of the vine, or the birth? Like you know, the way you could have the product of a tree, but you could also have the the uh, the, the product of 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 a mother as well. It would be kind of parallel, if in yeah. a metaphorical sense. Yeah, it's like giving birth or begetting or having a product of something along those lines. Yeah. Is that not what okay. fruit of the vine means? So it it fruit of the vine has a kind of it's a kind of double meaning. It's kind of like the the one that's birthed of the vine, as as, as Murad would say. So that's the sense of child, but also uh, fruit of the vine, just more directly. So has that double also meaning? Means product of the vine. Yeah. Um, so when we look at the context of it in Matthew's gospel, we, we see Jesus saying, first of all, this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. And then he refers to this, well, we can say child or fruit of the vine. And so when we read it in context, he's identifying his blood with the fruit of the vine. Now, this wouldn't be obvious, perhaps, um, maybe without knowing the Syriac, it's it's uh, well, we would we'd probably identify the fruit of the vine, but maybe the, in Syriac, the idea that it could be the, the child of the vine or the, the birth of the vine, it makes it even more vivid, I would suggest, in the Syriac. Um, so Luxembourg's solution is that the Quran renders Yalda child or fruit as well done, um, and, and where he gets it wrong, saying it just means boy. Um, one of the two meanings in the Syriac, but it now hides the link with grapes and spoils the original metaphorical meaning. Perhaps it didn't hide the meaning originally, but maybe later on when they started to to view it as just meaning boy, that's when the the original meaning was lost to some extent. Do you want to come in on that? Either of you? No, I agree. I agree. Okay. So, um, Christ uses the symbol of the vine in two different metaphors, and St. Ephraim is just uh, copying from what he reads in the Gospels, essentially. But in one, he is the vine, and his disciples, the Christians, are the branches, so John 15, 1. In another, at the Last Supper, he's the fruit of the vine, so Matthew 26. In Aramaic, it is even more meaningful, as it also means child of the vine, as we've just said. The vine then can mean, in this context, Mary. Um, St. Ephraim sometimes makes this metaphorical usage. Um, it's not fixed. Um, depending on the context, he might use a, a different metaphor, still using the same ideas like vine, grapes, and so forth, depending on what he's trying to convey in, in the hymn. 
Um, and I found this other passage, St. Ephraim um, talks about Eve and Mary in, in comparison to each other. So one is in the Old Testament, the other is in the New Testament, and he wants to suggest a contrast between the two. And he says, in place of that bitter fruit that Eve plucked from the tree, Mary gave mankind sweet fruit, and behold, the whole world enjoys the fruit of Mary. The virginal vine has borne a grape whose sweet wine has given comfort to those who mourn. So here, St. Ephraim is really telling us the meaning behind his, his metaphor in really clear terms. So when he's talking about grapes, we now know that what he really means is Jesus. And that's, that's kind of really crucial. Um, so how can we understand this? Well, this is according to Luxburg, and it's pretty much like what uh, Murad has said earlier. He translates the, the metaphor as follows, as follows. Ice fruits or grapes pass around among them. To see them, you would think they were loose, dispersed pearls. Um, in contrast to Eve's bitter fruit, paradise offers the fresh fruit of Jesus. Without being aware of this passage of St. Ephraim, i.e., in place of that bitter fruit that Eve plucked from the tree, Mary gave mankind sweet fruit. And using purely linguistic means, Luxembourg has suggested a meaning that is very close to that of St. Ephraim. Um, Murad, would you like to comment about Gabriel Salma's take on this, in terms of how he understands the, the metaphor? Gabriel Salma thinks that the word uh, hurain means uh, uh, raisins. But I go more with the understanding of uh, Luxembourg. Actually, the word hur in Arabic, if you look it up in a dictionary, it doesn't mean virgin. It means something like uh, brand new or uh, very, very white. So that's why um, the Sunni understanding, they said, well, if this woman is brand new, then she is a virgin. That's how this whole thing uh, got mixed up um, but here I, I, I agree with uh, Christoph Luxemburg and actually it's not a surprise that the Quran is borrowing from Mara Frime or Saint Ephraim because he did that before with the story of the people of the cave so why not with this also you see excellent yeah that's true and and that's that's a hundred percent given that he did borrow that's that's where he got it from so i think it's not it's not too much to to suggest that he's also borrowing these images from saint ephraim it's highly likely yeah now there are 400 hymns many of these hymns haven't been translated it's possible that um just some of these sorrows that we have may be just untranslated hymns that are there to be to be seen and compared and which might actually be just point for point straight out saint ephraim just to say that we are doing a, a study of this in London. We have a team that's working on this right now. And they're finding wholesale borrowings from St. Ephraim in the 4th century. Not just this. This is just one example of that. We'll be getting into that. We'll be introducing that probably later on in 2023. So don't, you know, don't be surprised that, we're, that the, not only is this, has this been borrowed from St. Ephraim, much, uh, many of the best material that are in the Quran are also borrowed from him. And if you notice, it's always the best stuff as well in the Quran, like the most poetic, uh, the most lyrical. It's, it's, it's from St. Ephraim. Could I just tell you one last thing, Mel, is that Gabriel Sauma also attests to the fact that uh, most of the Quranic borrowing is from St. Ephraim, even if he has a little bit of a different translation from Christoph Luxemburg. Also remember that the works that St. Ephraim has written is equivalent to all of the Sahih al-Bukhari, all of the Sunnah, all of the Arabic literature, and multiply that by 10. Yeah, you see, huge. so it, it was like an ocean. Syriac was like an ocean, and Arabic was just like a lake. So yeah. it's very likely that they were borrowing from him. Yeah. Okay, so um, this is a very common image of the story of Adam and Eve and uh, Satan is offering the fruit of the tree. Um, now, in the West, you know, the image that we have would be what? What kind of tree would we be talking about? Well, we'd be typically assuming it's an apple tree and, and there's a reason for that. In the West, Christians 
took the tree to be an apple tree due to a pun in Latin. Um, the Latin word for apple is malum, while the Latin word for evil is malum. And, it, you know, it became popularized with passion plays in, in medieval Europe. But in, in Syriac speaking uh, countries, that wasn't the, the way that they understood the tree. Living in a Mediterranean country, they would have gone for vines and there's plenty of vines mentioned in the Bible. So it made perfect sense for them to go with that take on the meaning. So um, based on the idea that the tree of knowledge is a way of partaking of God, some holy fathers, including St. Ephraim the Syrian, put forth the suggestion that the tree was a grapevine, for it was wine, the fruit of the grapevine, that Christ turned into his most pure blood during the Last Supper. The Lord said, I am the true vine, and my father is the husband man. John 15, 1. Now we also have a, an example from the Peshitta, uh, where it uses Yalda again as fruit or child. Um, for St. Ephraim, sometimes the tree is God, at other times it is Mary, with Jesus as the fruit of the tree. One example comes from Luke 1, 42, and it is translated as, blessed is the fruit of your womb. These are the words of uh, Elizabeth to Mary. And even when it was translated into Greek, they kept the word fruit. They could easily have said, blessed is the child of your womb, but they, they were conscious of the fact that there's uh, like a double meaning in Syriac, a very kind of a poetic meaning, and they try to retain that in the Greek. Do either of you want to comment on any of that? No, I agree. Can I just go back to what you're saying a little bit earlier concerning the Western view of the apple tree or just a tree, fruit tree, yeah. versus the vine that we have in uh, much of your Syriac writings? If that yes, is, so, then suddenly we, this makes sense. If the original tree, if the original fruit was a vine, then all the metaphors that we get of Christ comparing himself to the vine suddenly make sense, don't they? Absolutely, yeah. I think we've, in the West, I think we've lost that sense of, you know, so much of the, the, the New Testament, we've, we've become disconnected from it because we're just, we're using one metaphor, whereas the Bible is actually presenting us with a, a different metaphor in a sense. Yeah. Which now makes sense on almost what you're getting on in this whole episode. And that is, we've got to get back to this idea of vine and the grapes and the first fruits and all this that's in heaven. It was always meant to be a vine. It was always meant to be grapes. We have, unfortunately, even with the very first fruit, have tr transformed that into a tree. Of course, we would say apple tree it doesn't necessarily mean apple. But again, it takes away from all the references that we have to, that Christ did in many of his in many of his teachings later on. That has all been lost on us. Yeah, and I think it becomes really meaningful when you think of the Last Supper, because the Last Supper is like the moment when all of what happened in terms of Adam and Eve got undone. He became the new Adam. And an awful lot of the early church fathers would have referred to Jesus as the new Adam. So they would have totally got that meaning. Whereas unfortunately, a lot of Christians today have lost that sense of the meaning. So it's a, uh, yeah. Are we, are we assured? I mean, can we say that the Syrians, the Syriac uh, references, even in the Old Testament, the reference to the first fruit or the fruit that um, Adam and Eve ate of was a vine then? No, um, I think it's, I think this is, this, this is still in the realm of metaphor. So th there was no unanimity uh, among the church fathers. So some of them actually looked at the story and, and said, well, Adam and Eve had fig leaves. So maybe the tree was a fig tree, which makes perfect sense as well. Um, whereas other church fathers like St. Ephraim said, no, he went for the idea of uh, it being a vine tree or a vine, sorry. Um, and then between the first Eve, I mean, the first woman and the second woman, you know, the, the one is the bitter, we ate the bitter fruit, the, the other is giving now us the sweet fruit. Again, it's the same metaphor that has been that has been lost in us over these ages. Absolutely. Okay, so let's move on then we, we move on to Hurin. Um, he renders Hurin as white crystal clear grapes. Griffith says Luxembourg neglects finding instances of the actual currency in Syriac literature of phrases like his postulated white crystal grapes construed on the basis of grammatical and lexical possibilities alone. So in Luxembourg's favor, he, he basically comes to his conclusion purely on linguistic um, means. 
So he he's trying to avoid being influenced too much. And then he kind of leaves us with the possibility of testing his hypothesis by looking into the Syriac literature and seeing, are there actually instances of synonyms for, for example, crystal clear or white or grapes and so forth. And what we find is, yes, there are, there, there are these instances. So for example, in his Madrashi on faith, he's talking about Christ in the Eucharist and he, and he talks about holding the Eucharist in his hands. And he says, I set it, my brothers, in the palm of my hand that I might, might observe it. I was about to look at it on one side, but it had faces on all sides. Investigation into the sun is incomprehensible, for he is entirely light. In its clarity, I saw the clear one who is not clouded. In its purity, a great mystery, the body of our Lord, which is unsullied. In its indivisibility, I saw the truth, which is indivisible. I think here it's pretty obvious that he he's using multiple synonyms for crystal clear. This is what Luxembourg was postulating was St. Ephraim's vocabulary, which the, the Quran borrows. And I think here it's confirmed that actually this was the type of language that St. Ephraim would have used in some of his hymns. Do you want, either of you want to yeah, can I Can I just say something <clears throat> in the Quran when it references the disciples of Jesus? It doesn't say disciples. It says Hawariyin. And this is a very strange word that the Quran uses. Hawariyin if you go back to the root, it's Hur also. So the word Hur, if you are speaking about purely Arabic uh, rendering, it means that which uh, is evolving or glowing with whiteness. So this could be like a very exulting way of mentioning the disciples in the Quran with the same word. It's very strange how the Quran actually uses this word. That's interesting, yeah, because actually... It... If the word kind of relates to Christ, then his followers would be, as I say, literally Christians. Or they are whore who also, and they are, yeah. they are who themselves. Yeah. yeah, yeah, that's cool. Okay, so um, so white crystal clear grapes. So, however, the Quran reconstruct the Quran's reconstructed phrase "white crystal clear grapes" as Luxembourg sees it is remarkably consistent consistent with Saint Ephraim's extended metaphors of prizes, pearls and grapes. So the first one, he is entirely light. In its clarity, I saw the clear one who is not clouded. In its purity, a great mystery, the body of our Lord, which is unsullied. So there's your crystal clear given in Madrasha on faith, him one. And then the second one, the virginal vine has borne a grape whose sweet wine has given comfort to those who mourn. So we can see clearly he is using the very vocabulary that Luxembourg postulated. I think that's a good confirmation of his thesis. Um, so he renders, and this is this being Luxembourg, he renders that uh, Surah 37, 48 to 49 as they will have at their disposal hanging fruits for the picking, jewels like as were the pearls yet enclosed in the shell. So it's pretty much what you were saying earlier, when you, especially when you're talking about the branches and plucking from the branches. Um, and that's what Luxembourg concluded as well. Yeah, it's the um, same understanding, yes. Um, so note that in this ayah, um, what we're seeing are two common, two common symbols for Christ used by St. Ephraim, both grapes and pearls. And it's used in the same Quranic verse. What are the odds of that happening? And we can see the typical St. Ephraim imagery in Surah 76. So if you look at the first part there, the way, well, that's what Christianity was referred to in the first few centuries. Um, verse 5 then, the righteous will drink from a cup. That reminds me of the Eucharistic cup, a spring from which the servants of Allah will drink. Um, that relates very much to John 4.13, where Jesus refers himself as a spring of water. And then Ayah 8 fits perfectly with the, the parable of the sheep and goats. And then at the bottom there, uh, verse 12, you can see a garden and it fits in with St. Ephraim's idea of the paradise as being like a garden where there are vineyards and grapes and wine and so forth. If you look at the, the next part of Surah 76, that's exactly what we find. Verse 14, 
shades hovering over them and its fruit brought low within reach, exactly like what you were saying a few moments ago, Murad. Pass, passing around them are vessels of silver and cups of crystal. A cup whose flavor is uh, Zanzabil. And then we have another reference to the, the sprinkled pearls. And this is pretty much um, an image of paradise as full of vines and wine and so forth. I don't know if either of you want to comment on any of that. Yeah, could I just say that uh, the word that is always translated as garden in the Quran, uh, garden gives the impression that it's kind of small, like you could have a garden in your house. But yeah. when you look at the language in Arabic, it means something more like a forest. So Al-Jannah is a place where you have very high trees that makes a shade all over. Yeah. So this... Uh, I don't know how this would uh, enrich the what we are saying, but this is the reality of the world. Well, I, th I think it does re enrich it greatly because it, it, again, it's it it follows um, Saint Ephraim's idea of paradise, as we're going to see next. Because I'm going to take a look at, at a hymn, and it's pretty much like what you've just said. Okay, so let's look at that next. So this is from Madrasha nine, three, and four. So I'm just going to read from it. Um, this is. Uh, as I say, it's, it's from a madrasha on the subject of paradise. We can see that Luxembourg's rendering fits with Ephraim's hymn uh, perfectly. So here it is. Should you wish to climb up a tree with its lower branches, it will provide steps before your feet, eager to make you recline in its bosom above. On the couch of its upper branches, so arranged is the surface of these branches, bent low and cupped, while yet dense with flowers that they serve as a protective womb for whoever rests there. Who has ever beheld such a banquet in the very bosom of a tree with fruit of every savor ranged for the hand to pluck? Each type of fruit in due sequence approaches, each awaiting its turn, fruit to eat and fruit to quench the thirst, to rinse the hands there is due and leaves to dry them with after a treasure store which lacks nothing, whose Lord is rich in all things. Now, Murad, you just referred to the word garden as forest. This sounds very much like St. Ephraim's idea of paradise, where we just literally are in a forest and climbing up the branches and so forth. Actually, when you are reading now, uh, it's very hard to imagine that this is the that the Quran is not influenced by this. I am translating this stuff, and almost every word you have read, I have seen in the Quran, but in uh, in scattered places. The word Jannah, as I told you, uh, if you have Jannah, means you are covered. So it has to have covering and shading all over. It's not just the garden. It's it's a large forest. Yeah. Brilliant. Okay, it's, it sounds very promising, actually, in terms of the, the links here. So just to round up this a summary of the key decodings that I've suggested today, the grapes or grape is Jesus. Uh, he's the fruit of the vine. He's the child of the vine. And then the pearl again is Jesus. And we have a gospel passage, uh, Matthew 13, 45. He's referred to as the, the pearl of great value. Okay. And then if we look at the virgins of paradise, they're actually Jesus and Mary, because if Jesus is the grapes and Mary is the vine, who offers a womb-like welcome to the souls, all of this <clears throat> got muddled and Muslims were left with a confused idea of the Huris as ever virgin concubines in paradise. This was probably shaped by the influence of the harems at uh, Caliph palaces, which became the model and daydream of high society. That would be my speculation on how it went from grapes and vines to these uh, Huris in paradise. Um, what, what do you think of that idea, Murad? I like the idea. I just want to remind you also that the word Bikr, that in Arabic they say it means virgin. As I told you, it means brand new. When you say Bikr in Arabic, especially in the Quran, it means a brand new morning. The morning from the very start. So uh, it means virgin, but not as a, a young woman who is necessarily a virgin. It means brand new. So the connection that you are making here, uh, I think is probable also yeah so uh, like uh, if the, the idea of freshness really is, is conveyed um, exactly 
So just as Eve offered the fruit in paradise, Mary was the new Eve offering the sweet fruit Jesus in paradise. Somehow over time, separated from its Christian roots, the idea of Mary in paradise morphed into the Islamic blasphemous idea of Huris in paradise in complete contradiction of the Bible. And this is something that we often neglect to point out. At the, this is Jesus' words. At the resurrection, people will neither marry nor be given in marriage. They will be like the angels in heaven. So if the Quran is meant to confirm the Bible, they've obviously missed this verse because this contradicts their in interpretation. And lastly, uh, 72 virgins. Nowhere in the Quran does it refer to 72 virgins. This appears to come from al Tirmidhi. Um, my speculation is perhaps 72 was drawn from the idea of 72 hours being three days, length of time Jesus was buried in the tomb. Again, it comes back to Jesus. It may be that 72 appears somewhere in one of St. Ephraim's hymns. So, uh, so which one is the true meaning? Well, Muslims believe the meaning on the right is, is what the Quran is talking about. I would suggest it's partially the meaning on the left, at least the literal meaning, but ultimately it's about Jesus. So I'll come back to you. Okay, this has been great. Thanks so much, both of you guys. This is why I love bringing you on board. You really do unpack it. And of course, uh, this has huge ramifications. For those of you who probably aren't figuring and wondering what we're all talking about, uh, for most Muslims, or even if you've been watching on the news, most Muslims believe that when you die, you go to heaven. You have There is a garden waiting for you, and the garden has rivers of wine. It has rivers. Uh, uh, you can swim in that which you're not permitted on earth. You can swim in when you get there. And there are these perpetual virgins with, uh, with firm breasts and translucent skin and wide eyes and so this this is very much a very sexual paradise uh wine women in songs you might say and in this kind of has always been a surprise to many of us who are working with muslims we've always wondered what's going on here what where is this this paradise such a carnal paradise us you know, you can get it in Las Vegas, why wait? But certainly a, a, not a paradise that we see in scripture and not a paradise that we see in Christianity. This is a the paradise we see in Christianity. Yes, there is going to be a paradise. There is going to be like the Garden of Eden, but it's not what that is there. It's who that is there. Uh, we can't wait to get back to who he is. The fact that we were thrown out of God's presence, we want to get back into God's presence. Why do we need all these wine women in song? Well, obviously, this is what Ephraim, now what, what you're bringing up is Ephraim actually has the biblical view of paradise. Uh, he is not talking about wine women in song here at all. Uh, these beautiful pearls and these beautiful uh, grapes, what they are, these hoodies are grapes. <laughs> there are bunches of grapes waiting for them. Uh, and, and it's fascinating because the, the fruit of heaven are these grapes. Uh, and not only that, it is a place where we're going to be meet with God again. And Ephraim is getting people prepared for this and is showing this is what we're going to get back to. This is what we're what Adam and Eve had at the very beginning. We're going to get because of what Christ did 2000 years ago, or in his case, uh, 400 years earlier. So this is good that we're unpacking this. And I want to thank both Murat and Mel. You've done us a great favor by looking at chapter 37. We've looked at uh, chapter 52 of the Quran. We've looked at chapter 76. These three chapters specifically zero in on this idea of the hoodies, the idea of who they are. These are not virginal women that are perpetually virgin. That's not at all. These are the first, the freshest fruit. This is the beginning. Uh, you might say the brand new fresh fruit of the day. This is the best fruit that's waiting for us. Not virginal at all. And yes, they do have translucent skin, as certainly that's what the skin is on the grapes. Uh, it, it's it's going to be a real letdown for all those Muslims who are killing themselves, trying to get up there so they can have all these women. When they get there, they're going to be handed a bunch of grapes like you had in that picture there. It was fascinating. Even that guy's face was kind of <laughs> let down by what he is getting. That was a great picture. I don't know where you found it, but it, it really fits exactly what's the surprise they're all going to get. And yet, isn't that what happens with lots of Quranic material? These beautiful poems, you say about 400 poems that uh, Ephraim has written, uh, what a rich litany of material that those who were put to put the Quran together, and they had to put the Quran together quickly. They needed a book because they now had a man. They needed a book that the man, every prophet has a book. 
So they had the man, they needed a book. Where are they going to get the material? They're going to start borrowing right, left, and center. And they borrow Gnostic material, and they borrow Ethiopic material, and they borrow this Syriac material. And of course, the best material to borrow is that which is the most favored, which is Ephraim himself, because he, is, he, is, he has such a rich history. But when you're borrowing it, you're also then taking it. And as we've learned before, you can put in where your dots are and you can put where your vowels are and you can even recreate it. Maybe keep the same word, but put a different F emphasis and a different reference to it. And as Murad is saying, I don't know if you all re remember, the Arabic word today would not be necessary the same meaning as the Arab word, as the, uh, that same word before. We can give example after example of that. Uh, if I were to say you're a gay man, 50 years ago, a gay man means somebody who's happy. But today, gay means someone who's a homosexual. Words change, meanings change. They're changing in our lifetime. Therefore, we shouldn't be we shouldn't be surprised that the word huri, which was then used back, or even the, the, the example you're getting uh, of walid or waldin, uh, the word for boy, is actually was in the earlier days, was child. It wasn't just specifically one gender. If that is the case, then we need to go back to that original text. We need to go back to that earlier text. We need to go back to that earlier uh, dictionary term or, or uh, meaning and use that which the author intended. The problem is the Muslims don't know who the author is or what he intended. We are finding that out. And now suddenly this whole the whole text that we've been looking at in chapter 37 and in chapter 52 and in chapter 76 is actually a beautiful hymn of what was waiting for us in paradise. It is not a sexual paradise. <laughs> the Muslims are always bastardizing the text. They always want to get something sexual in there. And I think a lot of that is because that was their culture of the day. In the 8th and ninth century, this is what men did. They grabbed as many women that the right hand possesseth. It's right through the crock. There's many women as your right hand possesseth, and they, they use them as chattel and why why stop at 10 why stop at 20 let's go with 72 because that will be even more attractive for every man uh and by the time it's written by down by tirmidhi now tirmidhi is writing this down in the late ninth century so that's 300 years after the fact if we obviously if we even know if tirmidhi is the author so thanks so much you two this has been good and we're going to be doing more of this. As we've said er earlier in this episode, uh, we're going to be unpacking an enormous amount of this new material. Please, please, please go down to Murad's uh, uh, site. I have Here it is. I'm going to put it again. Here's the site down here at the bottom. Look and see what Murad is doing. Murad is uh, actually one of the experts in this field. He has read Salma. He knew, knows Luxembourg well. He is unpacking it for us, and he's helping us with the original language, and he's warning us that many of the words that are there today have were not the words the author intended and as we're now finding as certainly with the word hoodie it is not certainly not what the syriac writers were intending and certainly what Ephraim was intending what Ephraim was giving us was a beautiful image of god all the way through is a beautiful image of jesus the pearl is jesus uh, we see now the grapes are jesus uh the virgins are mary and jesus surprise surprise it's all about jesus have you noticed almost everything we've come to comes back to jesus god bless you mel and thank you so much Murad. you guys are doing a great work it's so good to have you on the team it's great to have you bring you on board again and we'll do this again we'll bring up some more new ideas as we unpack the quran we're finding it the more and more that we look at the more as we've said the more we scratch, the more we find. The more we find, the more they whine. The more they whine, the more uh, we, we shine. Oh, how sublime. Why do we shine? Because it's all about Jesus. And we want to bring you all back to Jesus. God bless you. Thanks, Murad, for uh, coming with us from way down uh, there in, in the Middle East. And thanks, uh, Mel, for coming on board also and introducing this, putting the PowerPoint together and walking us through it there in Ireland. This is Jay, Mel, and Murad. Over and out.